Yeah. Steve, I can see you. Good, good oh, evening. Great. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, oh, we, thank are, you. We, we are live now. Oh, great. I wanted to test it out. We are live. Well, thank you. What time is it for you now? Oh, it's about uh, seven o'clock. In the evening. Mm -hmm. I'm so full. happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. How was your day? Or your morning, I should say. Uh, for me, it is morning. It's 8.30. Have you had a chance to uh, look at some of the other um, speakers and everything else, uh, the other panels? No, not yet. Good morning, Hong Shuan. Good morning, Zach. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, Good morning. Mr. Steve Singer is there already. Uh, we have uh, three panelists. Or? Uh, yeah, Mr. G Gary Phillips also will join. Oh, OK, good. Yeah, sorry. I will, actually, we sent uh, you two uh, of my profile last yeah. night. So the the, the, the last one don't, is, worry. don't worry, not to worry. I think you can figure that out. Yeah. And, and uh, another panelist is uh, sorry. Uh, who is on the, on, the, on the video right now? The... Yeah, we are on the video now. OK. Is it Jerry or it's a... Gary. Steve, uh, OK, Gary. Steven Singer. Yeah. So, uh, 
we will uh, proceed at 8:45 um, and G gary can join okay so steve you you're also a law firm you're working for yeah for a law firm no actually i'm a partner in a cpa firm but i actually uh, do a lot of uh, high net worth families oh, okay. and really yeah. successful entrepreneurs oh, okay yeah. good evening gary happy thanksgiving uh, thank you thank how are you fine thank you yeah. we have got just one minute we will uh, proceed with our discussion So, so Gary, where, where are you located in right now? I'm in New Jersey, just west of New York City. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And Steve, are you? I'm in the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's yeah. go. What about yourself? I'm based in Beijing. In Beijing right now. Now I can see that it's quite warmer in your place. And Beijing is uh, is winter now. It's cold. I got the heat cold. on. I got the heat on here. You got heat on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's about freezing here, so it's it's not that much oh. different. <laughs> yeah, I know the New York, uh, New Jersey. Yeah, it's also quite yeah. cold here in the winter. Yeah, it's like 55 here. It's freezing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for participating in this panel discussion on post-COVID uh, business sentiment. Uh, my name is B. Tiagrajan. Uh, I'm Managing Director of Blue Star Limited. I am based in Mumbai, India. Uh, I have pleasure in introducing uh, the fellow panelists on in this session. Uh, we have with us Mr. Steve uh, Singer, um, partner Greenstein, Rolf, Austin and Company, USA. He is joining us from uh, San Francisco. Um, he is a lifestyle uh, connector and coordinator. Throughout his life, uh, Steven Singer has been successfully guiding ultra high net worth individuals, entrepreneurs and families through many tax, personal and financial issues. Steve's experience spans more than 37 years and his unique background and skills in venture and corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, high net worth individuals, corporate and partnership taxation and strategic planning give him unmatched insight into helping his clients achieve success. He creatively leverages relationships to help his clients grow their businesses and achieve their goals. In the post COVID sentiment, we will hear from him. What is in its store for him and his customer base uh, in uh, United States of America and throughout the world. I also have pleasure in uh, introducing Dr. Gary Phillips. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Orphomed, a development stage biotech company since 2018. Dr. Phillips has three decades of experience across healthcare. Before Orphomed, Dr. Phillips worked at Malincourt Pharmaceuticals, where he was executive vice president and chief strategy officer, as well as president of autoimmune and rare diseases. He was head of uh, global health and healthcare at World Economic Forum. He served in, in senior executive roles in Rickett Beckinsale, Pharmaceuticals, Bosch & Lamb, Merck, Novartis, Wyatt. He earned a BA in biochemistry from the University of Pennsylvania College of Arts and Sciences and MBA from Wharton School and MD from its School of Medicine. Dr. Phillips practiced as a U.S. Navy General Medical Officer. He currently serves as Chairman of the Board of Nanobiotics as well as Director on the Board of Alleria Therapeutics and Rayon Medical ESA. 
uh, he will share with us also uh, apart from the business sentiments how, how he sees the pandemic and whether it has come to any end and what uh, how and how we can leverage this uh, crisis into an opportunity as entrepreneurs um both uh, uh, steve uh, and uh, dr uh, gary phillips are joining on thanksgiving day it's an important festival in the united states uh, i am grateful to them for sparing time on this important day uh, i we have with us uh, mr hong kwan liu he is area of expertise include cross border investment and financing corporate law and m and a capital markets private equity and venture capital funds formation international dispute resolution he joins us from beijing uh, and mr liu has been elected as one of the 2020 alb china top in mnda lawyers he was awarded as china's leading lawyer in capital markets measure and acquisition and private equity fields by asia law profiles mm -hmm. iflr 1000 that is the international finance law review the legal finder legal band china business law journal and china law and practice uh, consecutively mr liu is an arbitrator of uh, ciatac a member of harvard law school alumni leadership council and the director of 2005 committee so uh, we, we know the geopolitical situation where uh, china is an economic importance and there are geopolitical tensions all combined together mr liu will also highlight to us that how uh, irrespective of what the political uh, discourse is as business community in solving this global supply chain issues how we can move forward in the post covid uh, era i will um, begin with uh, uh, steve singer uh for his uh, five minute opening remarks on how he sees the markets in the post covid era uh, thank you very What much you? yeah thank you very much for having me here um i'm seeing the united states and the families i think there's a lot of opportunity in the post covid era there is a lot of deal flow that we're looking at in terms of them investing in spacs or having their own private equity uh kind of companies that they're looking at uh we see a lot of growth in the ed tech sector and also a lot because the families are so entrenched in with their kids uh they're looking at um some ESG goals uh and companies that are really following the ESG goals uh from what i see on the post covid area i don't necessarily see it stopping right now I think that there's some bumps in the road that are occurring and until we get the vaccine that's coming through in a lot of different parts of the world so the variants don't come together that we're going to see a lot of different bumps coming through it's why you're seeing a lot of the supply chain disruptions and you're seeing um still some a lot of different lockdowns the traveling is kind of still getting restricted um but from all these things that I look at there's opportunities that the families are taking uh taking uh um uh notice of on different sectors uh, and as a result it it uh i i kind of see that um from investing in these particular sectors that you're going to see a lot more growth coming in for the next couple years for them so again with uh what i see with these disruptions always comes with opportunities if you know where to look for the opportunities and to take advantage of them so that's where i see uh, in terms of the post covid um situation with a lot of the families that i'm dealing with and then some of the other venture uh funds the venture capitalists that i'm looking at um there are some opportunities in the united states there's a huge amount of liquidity that's doing it so i see a lot of different valuations that are going up you know very very high that people are competing with the issue is is that for the entrepreneur even though there's a lot of liquidity in a lot of these different things they're looking at the venture capitalists that have been successful so those are the the the, the entrepreneurs that are are going to the venture capitalists and doing it 
I also see the rise of a lot of incubators that are coming through along around the world um, that uh, in the United States, a lot of venture capitalists and the successful ones are starting their own ones or have. So you're seeing a lot of these different entrepreneurs coming out. So again, I see it on a, on a positive side, even though we're getting some hiccups in, in this particular way. I think you're muted. Uh, thank you, Steve. I, I will come back to you with some specific questions as well, because you talked about family businesses. So in the post COVID era, how the realignment is taking place within the families, the young generation versus the old generation. And also about the valuations you talked about, the unicorns, whether it is real, how many of them are going to succeed where any bubble is building up. I'll, I'll come to that a uh, little while later. Um, what would you, Dr. Phillips, um, you are opening remarks, specifically uh, the uh, how you see the pandemic. It, it is over uh, or it is going to linger around for a longer time. Uh, or uh, can we say that the worst is over? Now we can we have learned to live with it. Now, in terms of healthcare, the developing nations, how uh, they can charter their uh, path ahead, uh, how to build a robust healthcare infrastructure, uh, both in pharmaceutical as well as the hospital infrastructure. Over to you. Sure, that's a lot to cover. Um, but thanks, thanks for the introduction, for including us. So I think with regard to the pandemic, um, my sense is that, I mean, obviously, <laughs> to think back, it was about two years ago when the pandemic first, you know, started to make itself known um, in China. And, 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 you know, a lot has been learned over two years. It's been incredible to think back over two years, what we've learned and what we felt sort of end of 2019, early 2020 versus what we know now. We made incredible strides, right? In a record period of time, we were able to develop multiple successful vaccines, and also now with the antivirals, right? So both Merck and Pfizer have developed antivirals, which seem to be quite effective in keeping people out of the hospital and ultimately from dying. So I, I believe that it's hard to say the worst is behind us because I think it really comes down to, to region by region. Uh, it seems as though once we snuff it or we stamp it out a little bit in one region, it pops up again. So, you know, we had a surge in the U.S. and Europe is relatively quiet. Now the U.S. has come down a bit and Europe is raging again. You have governments which are changing their posture on a zero COVID policy into one where it's learning to live with the disease. I think, you know, I, none of us was alive um, when the pandemic, the Spanish flu of the early uh, 20th century occurred. But ultimately, Spanish flu went from being a pandemic to an endemic uh, disease where now you have seasonal flu. It does still kill a number of people, and it really kind of migrates up in you know, north and south, depending on the, the season, uh, the northern and southern hemispheres, uh, really, with the, with the seasons. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up with an endemic COVID, similar to what we're seeing with flu. And so I think, ultimately, we need to learn how to live with it, because it, it's important for, you know, for economic prosperity and for people to be productive, that we need to be able to continue to do our jobs and, 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 and you know, create great things for the world, um, regardless of COVID. So, you know, it's created an enormous, so, so, enormous social divide. Um, and there is a, human, a huge economic and social divide across nations. And so I don't think until we're able to get, you know, truly global adoption uh, of the vaccines in particular that we're going to see it. And, and there has only been one really scourge that's been eradicated. And so I don't envision that it's necessarily going to be eradicated, but I think we're just going to learn how to deal with that. And ultimately the virus will mutate, right? The, the virus ultimately will mutate because it doesn't want to kill all of its hosts. It wants to spread, not kill, but rather be able to, to thrive and, and, and spread. So I think you're, you're going to end up with potentially a less virulent form, uh, which ends up living in our, in, in the populations around the world. That's my sense. But I think a lot of doctors or a lot of um, medical experts have, have felt as though we're going to be in a period where we're going to have to have frequent vaccines, you know, booster shots in order to assure that we stay ahead of uh, the mutations that occur in the virus. That's the way sort of I see the, the pandemic. So I, I, 
My sense is that in many parts of the world, the worst is over because now we have vaccines and we have therapeutics that will address the virus. And it's better than sitting there, uh, sitting there as victims to a virus we can't treat. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of parts of the world that don't have access to those to those therapeutics and medicines. And I think so. So it's, I can't say it's over for the world um, with regard to, to what it's done to healthcare, It's been I don't know if there's a sector in, in the economy which has been more affected by covid than healthcare. Uh, number one, I think it's actually created a smaller world with regard to healthcare. Right. We saw during the surge of the pandemic in the early 2020, you saw medical supplies flowing between countries. You saw where masks or oxygen was flowing from country to country, uh, diagnostics were flowing, uh, vaccines were flowing. And, and what I've seen, in, especially in, within countries, is that, and I see this a bit you know, with, uh, across countries as well, is that medical mm, services flow. So you may have uh, physicians, nurses who move from country to country where under normal times, you would not have the license to practice. You know, personally, I'm, I'm licensed in the United States in the state of New Jersey. But during COVID, uh, I was able to practice anywhere in the United States, where, which I was not allowed. But so I think that breaks a bit of a taboo where telemedicine and flow of, of uh, medical talent across geographic lines is occurring. So now you may have a physician in China or India who's maybe reading an X-ray or looking at a, a you know microbial sample with telemedicine, and they can practice essentially in a country where they couldn't previously. So I think COVID has created a smallness of the world with regard to to um, to the medical space. The, the last thing I'll do before I finish in terms of my opening comments on healthcare is that at least in the in the area where I've spent most of my career, which is in pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. Um, number one, it's it's allowed the acceleration of technologies where it had spent you know really decades incubating. So mRNA technology, which is the you know foundation for both the Moderna and the BioNTech Pfizer vaccines, uh, had been under development since the 1980s, but it never really found its therapeutic application until in the application to the COVID vaccine, when the spike protein was the target. And so I think you know acceleration of technologies has come from this pandemic. And there's been a huge influx of capital into uh, biotech and medical technologies because you look at Pfizer, right? $100 billion in revenue from, from their COVID vaccine, hundreds of billions of dollars from their antiviral. So venture investors see that there's a huge return if they're able to invest in, in, in innovation, which will benefit society. And so there's been a huge influx into, uh, into, into healthcare investments, whether it be through SPACs or whether it be through venture investments. Um, and that's going to accelerate uh, innovation and development of new technology. So similar to other, you know, they say it's, you, you don't want to waste a good crisis, right? <laughs> it, it's a shame. You, you, you need to take advantage of the crisis. It, it, it's crisis is a bad thing, but often it, it creates huge growth opportunities. And I think that's what we're going to see from the COVID, at least in the health and the life sciences, is that um, this, with the increased capital available to invest and, uh, you know, scientific breakthroughs ready for investment, you're going to find a consequence of this pandemic will be new innovative technologies in healthcare that actually benefit humans outside the area of infectious disease. So that, that's my opening comment. So, Seth, you, you mute again. Thank you. That is, uh, that's wonderful. We will come back to you with uh, specific inputs uh, for the Asian countries, what we can learn and uh, how we should progress towards a robust healthcare infrastructure in, in this uh, part of the world. Uh, we will move on to Mr. Liu. Uh, the... Um, um, you know, uh, China uh, is an important uh, destination for quite a few components for the world that it has been manufacturing uh, components for every industry, uh, apart from finished goods. Uh, now, the supply chain interruptions are becoming a bottleneck as far as uh, the economic recovery is concerned, that uh, you're including United States, you find the demand is so very high 
but you are not able to get the components across some are uh, political issues connected with the barriers being created uh, tariff or non tariff barriers the other one is really uh, the the world has not created across a equitable uh, way of uh, a component or a supply chain uh, infrastructure across so um, you 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 are also a, a private equity player venture capitalist uh, how do you see uh, the future of manufacturing as far as china is concerned ah uh, thanks sir uh, yeah i just i my my speech will will be more uh, focused on the uh, china china's un- unique way of fighting the pandemic and and also that has a lots of lots of to do with the uh, uh china's economy situations and also the as you mentioned that the manufacturing uh supply chains in china which is a uh, important part of of the whole uh, world supply chain now uh, probably all, you all know that china took uh, a quite a different approach uh from uh different from many other countries especially united states and uh, western countries um so it was called the zero tolerance uh which is characterized by uh quickly lockdown of cities and area where the virus was found and strict tracking of the the patients and and a co- and strict quarantine method and half forced uh vaccinations so the method uh initially proves quite uh, successful so they quickly control the spread of the covid from wuhan to other part of uh, china unfortunately not to the other part of the world and also make china uh, as quick in recovery from the pandemic so uh, so especially in the first half, uh, second half of 2020 and, and first half of this year um but it has a huge economic uh price to pay uh because of this method and first of all despite all these very draconian method um the chinese government and the public found that uh the covid is cannot be totally eliminated um they have only yesterday there's a a, a small uh a breakout in shanghai and we we from time to time uh, in other parts of china just send nervous shock to many parts of other parts of china and also to the world um and so the, because of the chinese government's method the personal and business travel uh is substantially restricted and and international business uh almost all international travel almost come to a complete stop uh so we have to as a lawyers we have to negotiate all the contracts through the zoom it's sometimes it's very hard to do that and and also uh, for the supply chains um there's also business activities in the area where where is the uh, virus was uh, founded um there are also substantially business activities reduced uh because of the um interruptions of transportations and also lockdown of the factories from time into time uh the china is i think right now is facing a quite uh, strict situations uh so the gdp of the uh, third quarter of this year has dropped um before below 5% which uh, we haven't seen for almost for the case um this not only pan- uh, uh the pandemic but also the uh, ongoing china and us trade war and also chinese government uh, probably you have heard uh, from the media that their own heavy handedness of certain uh, chinese companies for example the online education and also on some of the high tech company like alibaba and and, and the dd you know, they also send a chilling effect on the whole industries um not only uh the industries that has directly affected uh, and also i think the mindset of people is also are, are changing and the china you know chinese government is always famous for the heavy handedness but during the uh pandemic uh, in the name of the fighting the pandemic uh they have been more deeply involved more willingly to Im- involved and interrupt the business and personal lives uh to the to the de- degrees that we cannot imagine 2 years ago um so the business world is really concerned about whether things will get back to normal even if the the pandemic was a 
uh, successfully controlled uh, because the, the 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 behaviors of the uh, government and also the pu public attitudes towards these uh, restrictions uh, also change uh, fundamentally. Uh, well, there's a uh, still opportunities for the uh, foreign companies and investors or uh, business partners who have uh, trading or business relationship with China. Uh, first of all, I think China uh, as Chinese government repeatedly uh, emphasize that China's open door policy will uh, remain, uh, but there will be add a lot of uncertainties in specific industries uh, due to the tightened international and the domestic enrollment. Um, and also uh, because of the ongoing China-US trade war and also uh, the limits of on uh, Chinese companies access to high-tech company uh, and also advanced equipment, uh, they will, China will, it's now more for, emphasized on self-reliance and also controllable supply chain. Um, so that will also create a lot of opportunities. So the Chinese government will encourage, especially in the semiconductor uh, and healthcare area, uh, because we uh, uh, we have done like more than 30 uh, PCP and VC back transactions this year. And I think more than 75% is in the semiconductor and healthcare area, just as Gary mentioned, that will be uh, a lot of new technologies uh, has been uh, tried and also uh, many of these transactions actually is cross-border uh, licensing or acquisition. Um, so I think the business people should watch for the areas where, where the Chinese government is encouraged, uh, such as I mentioned that uh, semiconductors, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, new energy, and green economy. And, and, and importantly, more team up with the local partners and the localizations uh, of its operation. So to uh, avoid the risk of the uh, international uh, uncertainties of the business environment. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Han Chuan. Uh, that's a very wide uh, the areas that uh, that you could touch upon. Uh, it is very interesting, um, I, and also it builds an anxiety that uh, what what next uh, China will do. The uncertainty definitely continues uh, as far as. Uh, I am concerned. I do not know the collective view uh, with regard to uh, how one should look at China as a destination for investment or a destination for sourcing and manufacturing. Uh, we, we will come back to that. Uh, I get back to uh, Steve. Um, the, um, the there are two questions I have. You know, we are left with another fifteen to twenty minutes. One question is connected with the new generation in the, in the family businesses. Um, the post-COVID, uh, whether the young generation wants to pursue the traditional business or reinvent or leave it and start something new uh, in, in the way where the capital is available and the valuations of new economy companies are uh, disproportionate. You could have created a company uh, 80 years ago, 70 years ago. That valuation is uh, pathetic compared with someone who started four months ago. So this is one question I have. The second one is connected with the valuation itself. That is it. Another dot com building up with these unicorns with many of them have sound business models, but quite a few of them do not have models. They are burning money but still enjoy huge valuation. So in that context, uh, your inputs, specifically keeping in mind the developing nations. Mm -hmm. So um, even before uh, COVID was happening, there's been a huge um, transition of wealth going on throughout the world on these families because you have the older generation getting older and the younger generation kind of coming through and, and looking at things a lot differently than the older generation. Uh, in terms of the way that I see and how to um, get the younger generation involved with the businesses of the older generation, there has to be listening on both sides. Um, a lot of times that the older generation thinks it has to be done a certain way and then the younger generation says it's got to be done the other way. And if in fact, if you 
go and you let the younger generation um, speak to how the new technology or what they're thinking of so that they can reinvent the old companies along with the capital that it's being produced, you'll get better results in terms of doing it. And either it's going to be a adjunct or a, a an offshoot of whatever that business is, because that business has a lot of the different customers that are still there that are still very, very valuable. Um, and so in terms of the, the process, you have to listen to the younger generation and then also to educate the younger generation from the older generation that it's not about just money. It's about what the family legacy is and how the legacy of the family, how they want it to be. OK. And in terms of doing that, you have to have the younger generation kind of get uh, involved with that particular process at a very young age, okay? And if you start to do that, then it's a lot easier to look at the legacy of whatever the family is, the family objectives are, um, the family foundations in the U.S. of uh, how they're, they're transferring wealth to doing it for more of the ESG goals that the younger generation is more apt to be excited about than the, than the older generation, which is just about making money. So, in terms of looking at these things, I see some families that are very successful in transitioning. And if they're not going to transition, then basically the, the family has to get together and decide what they're going to want to do and how they're going to transition out for a liquidity event so that they can start to look at whatever the next step is for the family in order to do whatever they want to do. And so that's where, to me, the succession planning and how getting somebody to bridge that gap between the older generation and the younger generation and listening to that. That's why when I look at the younger and being able to integrate in with the younger generation is, is seeing um, that it's very important that you get somebody to do that because the family dynamics are, you know, sometimes get a little bit messed up. And that's another reason to bring in somebody to so you can listen to both sides. The second question you asked, which is basically the valuation, you have a lot of money that's chasing a lot of money. And so um, what I see is this is no different than a bubble, okay, that it's coming up to be a bubble. Um, it's just a question of when you want to get out of the bubble, okay? So it's kind of like where else are you going to put your money? And so, I, you know, traditionally what you would see is you'd see you could put it in real estate, you could put it in different other asset classes, and doing uh, and, and get the, the return. So what I see the new asset classes coming up is like things in, in NFTs, okay? There's a lot of wealth creation that I see uh, that our families are starting to get into right now and NFTs, they don't really understand it, but that's where I see that it's coming into. Um, and until the liquidity kind of drives up, then you're not gonna see you know, these, these huge valuations. The second thing that I've seen that's different than this this particular area than probably 10 years ago is the family offices are starting to bond together with sidecar deals along with the VCs. So what you're seeing is you're seeing the family offices becoming more of a force than just the venture capitalists. And also they're also looking at different private equity deals. So I see the buildup of the family offices as they start to uh, looked at co-investing together uh, and getting uh, advice on, on how to do that and the experts involved, that that kind of helps out that for them to invest and, and do the deals. So that's what I see in terms of that. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, that's comprehensive. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Phillips, actually, Mr. Narayanan has posted a question for you already, which I had in mind. So he is asking, do you like the, uh, do, do you think the boom in uh, the uh, biotech, pharma investments is driven by the fear of pandemic and importantly, or the second part of that is the availability of excess EC capital? Uh, specifically in the U.S. Is the fear driving it or the capital? Um, I, I don't necessarily think the, the fear is driving it. Um, 
I mean, I, I, you know, they always say fear and greed, that's what drives, right? And, and I think that probably early the fear was driving it. I know, you know, I sit on the board of a company uh, called Aldera, which you read in, the, in, my, in my bio. Uh, we had a, an anti-inflammatory drug in our uh, pipeline, which we thought might interrupt the inflammatory cascade that was caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so, it, you know, our decision to move that and we, you know, we went to the FDA and we got, um, you know, authorization to move into patients with this, with this drug. And that was all driven by fear because we were just looking for anything at that moment to see if it might work, right? Because we were just, all, everyone was just trying to save the world from thing we really didn't understand by trying to find things that work. And they tried monoclonal antibodies and they tried antivirals and all, you know, and, and, and all these other these things um, that many of them did cho- didn't really turn out. So I, yeah, I think that a lot of the fear driven investment is, is more like a two year old, you know, year and a half year old story. I think the story now is that, you know, a bit to what Steve was saying is that there's a lot of capital out there looking for worthy investments to get a proper return and healthcare is an area where there may, that may exist just because, you know, we, we, you know, as society, we've doubled the life expectancy over the last hundred years, but that doesn't mean we can't double it again. Right. So I think there's, even though we've, been able to succeed quite a bit relative to a hundred years ago with regard to medicine, there's still a lot we can do. And so I think the opportunity for innovation and for progress is there. And if you can, you know, use capital in a very effective way, you can generate things that are really beneficial to society and pro- provide a very nice return to your investors. So I think it has more to do with greed at this point than fear. Um, so that's that. Uh, I know you may not swing around to me again, so I just wanted to just answer your, your other question so you can kind of go on and finish the panel. The other question you had had um, at the beginning, which was around, you know, developing nations and their, the effect in the healthcare arena to developing nations. And I think, you know, the, that again, we could spend an entire panel on that. But first, um, the developing nations have benefited from investment you know, historically from the richer nations, right? whether it be for HIV therapeutics, whether it be other anti-infectives like anti- antibiotics, um, hep C, uh, and now I think with, with uh, COVID, um, the investment made by richer societies and maybe, you know, pl- places that have more developed scientific capability have been able to provide innovations that will benefit, you know, developing nations. But beyond that, Um, I also think that things like telemedicine and technology enabled uh, healthcare uh, will benefit. We've seen this in the past and I think it's going to be future. I mean, everyone talked about, you know, Africa didn't have the infrastructure of landlines in their telecommunications. And so they could quickly adopt mobile communication. I think the same thing we're going to see uh, with the telehealth um, and, and things that have come out of advancements coming out of COVID which will benefit developing nations. They don't necessarily need to build, you know, clinics and hospitals because they can benefit from telehealth. Um, uh, and I think that it may not be revolutionary, but I think it is quite progress over the past couple of years. And I, I do believe that that will be a positive effect, you know, on, on uh, developing nations. So I'll leave it at that. So I, I don't monopolize the time. Uh, so with your experience, uh, you know, uh, as a part of the World Economic Forum and the global health and healthcare, and you're a regular speaker in RASIS events, um, what, what is your uh, advice to the uh, MSMEs, medium, small, micro enterprises located in, uh, the, uh, in India or Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia? What, what 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 is your recommendation to them? What they should look at, including Myanmar. Yeah, I mean the one thing that we found uh, when I was at the World Economic Forum, we were running demonstration projects around the world, trying to see how we can improve healthcare, especially in developing nations. We actually did an entire study with uh, Boston Consulting Group, uh, looking at leapfrog. We called it, you know, how can developing nations leapfrog in terms of 
advancing healthcare so they don't need to basically mis repeat mistakes made by developed nations. Um, in the end, healthcare is a is a local product. Even though we talk about telehealth and we talk about telemedicine, really, you know the the diseases which exist in a in a, in a country and the sort of the epidemiology and population statistics you know dictate really uh, what is needed. So you can't necessarily apply a model. So so I think you know ultimately every country needs to figure out how it can best serve the 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 issues that its population is dealing with and, and try to figure out whether they can leverage things that have been tried and failed or maybe have worked in other countries. So for example, in Asia, uh, you know, and in, and in many developing countries, you know, infectious disease still, and let's take COVID out of the equation, infectious disease still is one of the leading causes of, of, of mortality and morbidity in those populations. Whereas in some of the Western societies, it's more chronic disease like cancer and cardiovascular disease and such. And so, you know, you don't want to necessarily take, a, you know, a Western Europe, U.S. model and in infectious disease management um, because you need to manage your population. So what I would say is, you know, really focus on the needs of your population. See if you can actually borrow something that may have worked somewhere else. See if you can actually get it, get access to technologies developed elsewhere and apply it to your population. And that's it. I mean, I, I know it's simplistic, but that's that's the best I can do in you know five minutes. Yeah, I can imagine that. Thank you very much, um, uh, Hong Chun. Um, you know, yeah, Mr. Narayan had raised this question also. The, what are the growth of supply chain issues? The demand came back from July when the second wave was over in India. Uh, uh, the the uh, a very big revival of demand. But unfortunately, the commodity prices went out of control, steel, copper, or anything, microprocessor, so on and so forth. The second thing is the container shortage itself. The, you could not move the goods from many parts of the world. The third one is the, um, uh, the availability itself, that you need to book well in advance. Now, uh, in the process, what's happened is the prices have gone up, demand is still holding, but the supply chain issues are lingering. I think it is going to be another one year or so before things will regress. That's my rough estimate. I, I don't think this problem is going to get sorted out uh, very fast. Uh, in that context, uh, we, we are hearing that China blocked the steel for some uh, two years or five years. Uh, Microprocessors have been booked for five year period, eight year period. So the, the, the thing is, what is your perspective uh, from your clients? You will know that uh, how do uh, one um, plan for this uh, when China will resume these supplies for, for the entire world or at least not block the quantities for uh, many, many uh, years so that the others can also get components. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good question. Uh, but unfortunately, probably I don't have an, a good answer for that. Um, yeah, I, I think probably right now it's, uh, China will have the host, uh, winter Olympics, uh, in, in, uh, uh, February of next year. Uh, after that, and I think we it also depends on the whole world. If the pandemic in the other parts of the world, uh, get controlled, I think China will, um, we will we'll, we'll also gradually release uh, uh, the, the, the current uh, draconian method for the uh, uh, pandemic control. And also for the supply chain and trading, I think China to some extent is a good beneficiary of the pandemic in terms of uh, supply chains, because especially in the last year and, and first half of this year when the whole world uh, basically uh, shut down or, or the capacity has not been fully used. But China still maintain a pretty good state for most of the uh, uh, factories and most of the companies. They can still keep the supply uh, chains working uh, around the world. Um, but now with the, the challenges that we, now with the capacity uh, are recovered in many other parts of the world, China is no longer the, the unique suppliers of the, of the commodities and how they deal with the um, deal with this new situation. As I mentioned, that they are they have by it, it size and bad impact of their uh, unique uh, anti-pandemic uh, methods. So that's, and also have already have impact 
on the whole economy. Uh, hopefully, China can adjust their policies quickly enough and, and to be a more um, adopted to the new situation and challenges. Thank you. So as we wind up, uh, I begin with you, uh, Hong Chuan. Uh, what one word? Uh, what is the greatest lesson you have learned through this pandemic? Um, I think the globalization and integration with the world is very important. Um, may, but even if some people are not realize that, uh, but but it is very important. We are really. Are interdependent uh, global village. Yeah, as soon that by by this pandemic, so we are really part of the whole world. You cannot one country cannot survive well without the other countries. No, even if you want to close it down. But yeah, that that's a very laudable response, Sanchon. Thank you, uh, Steve. You are your sentence on the big lesson that you have learned and the sure. message for the audience. For the for the pandemic, I think that there are two things. One is patience, okay, learning patience, uh, and the other thing is eco as opposed to ego. So you get a lot more when you start to look at synergies along with people that you can accomplish a lot more things than if you are just an ego that's just looking at one thing and going toward a path. That's what. Basically, that I see the more successful people have done during the pandemic and going forward. That's what I see. Thank you, uh, Gary. The last word as we yeah. wind up uh, the the one sentence your lesson learned or the message to audience. Yeah, I think the future is not easily predictable. I mean, in 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 March of 2020. Uh, it, when the stock market dropped, I thought that was the way we were going. It made a lot of, <laughs> I, I thought we were going down the hill and then, you know, the stock market climbed last year about this time. I thought the pandemic was close to being over, but we know a year later because of people not getting the vaccine, et cetera, it's not. So you think you can predict the future, but it's, it's not as obvious as you might think it is. Well said. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for uh, sparing time and participating in this important event. Uh, Horesh is Asia, uh, continue to grow, continue to attract audience. Your uh, insights were very useful. Uh, thank you, audience, uh, for participating in this session. Uh, see you see soon in one of the other events. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, Steve and Gary. Uh, thank you. Have a great evening. All right. Take uh, care. Have a great day, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you very much. much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, audience. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. All right.